follow up on some breaking news. Uh, we are hearing uh, from sources that the president will in fact seek re-election in 2020. We want to bring in Major Garrett right away. Uh, Major, Major, this is your wheelhouse. What are you hearing? What's going on? And why are you giggling? Be well, because I just giggle quite naturally. Uh, <laughs> No, here's the reason I'm laughing. It's not a secret, and it's not breaking news, President <laughs> Trump is seeking re-election. Remember, he's the first American president in my memory, and I think possibly ever, to file paperwork for his campaign for re-election on Inauguration Day. He did that, and he's held nine campaign re-election rallies as president of the United States. But what he didn't have was the beginnings of a campaign infrastructure for 2020, and that is the news today. Because I've confirmed through sources very close to this always existing re-election campaign in 2020 that there's now a campaign manager, Brad Parscale. And for those who may remember some of the significant figures of the 2016 Trump for President campaign, Brad Parscale ran the entire digital program and was a very close associate of Jared Kushner. And this appointment of Brad Parscale as chairman of the president's re-election campaign is viewed by many as a reflection of that very close relationship with Jared Kushner. And to have Jared Kushner not only have a hand in quite a few issue items here at the White House on a day-to-day -day basis, but to have his hands very much involved in the building of the machinery for a Trump re-election campaign in 2020 with his very close associate, Brad Parscale, as campaign manager. Why now, Major? Why, why at this moment would the president decide to announce that, in fact, he's putting the mechanism in place so that the re-election campaign can begin? Well, because there's no time like the president in politics, number one. Number two, this president is looking at a very grim, or at least potentially grim, midterm 2018 cycle. And he knows a lot of Republicans, certainly in the House, and there are anxieties now creeping into the Senate, Republican cloakroom as well, that this could be a very tough year for Republicans. They could possibly lose control of the House, not expand their majority, possibly lose it in the Senate. And that would basically leave this president with just himself as the head of the Republican Party and no longer Republican majorities in the House or Senate if things really tilt toward the Democrats. So he's got to build a machinery for his re-election campaign in 2020 and start focusing on that. Now, I will tell you, there are plenty of congressional Republicans who look at that idea and say, well, these don't really match. Mr. President, what you need to do is focus on 2018. You need to help down-ballot Republicans running for re-election in the House and the Senate. Don't worry about your re-election. Worry about our re-election, because without us, you don't have a congressional Republican majority. So there will be those who will look at this 2020 campaign announcement and the building out of this team and say, Mr. President, your priorities are a little on the indulgent side. What we need you to do is focus money, effort, politics on the 2018 midterms, not 2020 re-election. So this will not in every way, shape and form land enthusiastically among Republicans because it does appear that the president's putting his political future and his political priorities possibly slightly ahead of those down-ballot Republicans seeking re-election in 2018. You know, Major, that's really interesting because when I heard you say this, I thought, okay, the president's going to be out maybe participating in more of those campaign-style rallies that we know he really likes. That's where you see his personality and he seems to shine. And I thought maybe that would actually help the down-ballots because, you know, if the president can do anything, he can cer certainly ignite the base. He can, uh, um, he can um, bring energy to the Trump movement if you will, and that's got to sort of trickle down to other Republicans, right? It could, and it's a very good point and a valid one to keep in mind. Now, the president has obviously not shied away from doing campaign rallies already. He likes them, as you say, and he does create a certain amount of energy and a decent crowd side, size with those rallies, and that can be beneficial. What's most important for this White House, though, is matching the president's own political rhetoric with the legislative agenda and the legislative accomplishments on Capitol Hill, because that's essentially how members of Congress are judged. What have you produced? What have you failed to produce? And linking those things up with the White House is what typically happens in a midterm election cycle. And this one is quite obviously very different because so many of the early soundings in special election races around the country, now on the House side, 
Republicans have won House re-election races in special election formats, but they lost the Senate seat in Alabama. And at the state level, a lot of races that don't grab a lot of national attention but are familiar to those of us who track all of the small tremors in American politics, at state levels, open races have gone decidedly for Democrats for one simple reason. Republican turnout has been either at projection or lower than projection, and Democratic turnout has far exceeded historical projections, which means Democrats are psyched up, eager, enthusiastic about participating in all elections, not just the House and Senate ones pending in November. So that sense of enthusiasm, that sense of activism on the Democratic side of the aisle is worrisome for congressional Republicans and this White House. And congressional Republicans view that as a much higher and much more significant priority, not only for their future, but the future of the Trump agenda than the president's reelection campaign in 2020. Sure, a lot of people who never thought they'd be running for office now, in fact, are running for office um, as a direct result of President Trump. Uh, but let's talk about Brad Parscale, a close friend of Jared Kushner's. Uh, who is he? What was his role prior to this? And now going forward, what do you think he can achieve? Well, like many in the Trump campaign, especially in the inner circle, a complete newbie to presidential politics had never done it before. And what Brad Parscale did was innovative, but uh, not in the way that incremental innovations had been brought to previous campaigns. Essentially what he did is he kept an eye on Facebook and Twitter relentlessly during the campaign. And he would watch everything that the Trump campaign did or said, and then across his entire field of Twitter and Facebook research, ask two questions basically hour to hour and certainly day to day. What things resonated, what things were shared, what things were retweeted, what things brought the Trump community in social media closer together, what knitted them together and reinforced. He would do that at the debates. He would do that with every major speech candidate Trump gave. And through that information and what resonated on social media, they would then match that information with their data sets held by the Republican National Committee to contact voters, re-engage them, and make sure that they would turn out. And it was that meshing of voter data files held by the Republican National Committee and all the Republican National Committee's field operations and this overlay of Parscale's social media metrics that allowed the Trump campaign to have some sense of who their supporters were and how likely they were to turn out. And as the campaign closed, it was that alignment of social media data and underlying door-to-door -door data that the Republican National Committee held that gave them a sense this race might be winnable. No one predicted that, but they thought it might be winnable. And it turned out they were right. So we have someone to run the campaign, but I'm wondering if the president is going to find himself facing a similar problem to what the administration is finding, is being able to gather enough people that have the skills to pull off another successful election. I mean, many of the people that participated in the previous election, in his previous campaign, are now being questioned by the Mueller investigation. Well, that's certainly a distraction, to put it mildly. and. Quite apart from the people who would or would not be in the Trump campaign is a much more practical reality. Donald Trump's not going to sneak up on anyone this time. He's not going to stun the political class and the so-called elites and the media and other boogeymen and women that the Trump supporters like to point to and did so routinely in the 2016 campaign. So this campaign is going to have to structure itself differently and it's going to have to organize itself differently simply because it won't fly under the radar, if you will. Not that it was anything about Donald Trump that flew under the radar, but the sense that he didn't really have a full-fledged campaign clearly gave Hillary Clinton and a lot of sympathetic Democrats the sense, it turned out to be misplaced, that they were a much more organized and formidable campaign than Donald Trump brought on Election Day. In fact. His campaign was plenty formidable, but that sneak up factor is not going to be available to him in 2020. And he's going to have to construct a campaign on different metrics and with different people and in different ways than he did in 2016. 
and it will be an enormous task for Brad Parscale to carry that out and for Jared Kushner or anyone else associated with it because you can't run the same playbook that was available 